welcome back. And our second invited speaker for the day is Dr. Mark Hakkinen. Uh, it's my honor to introduce him. Dr. Mark Hakkinen is a research scientist focused on accessibility and assistive technologies of the Educational Testing Center, Testing Service ETS in Princeton, New Jersey. He is an expert in accessibility and assistive technologies and has worked in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Mark has been involved with user interfaces and accessibility since his undergraduate years when he worked as a research programmer at the Central Institute for the Deaf in St. Louis, Missouri, developing hardware and software used in speech and hearing research. His early graduate research examined the use of synthetic speech-based warning systems in complex human-computer environments. He spent his, a good deal of his professional career in user interface research and development for a variety of big and small software companies in New Jersey, where accessibility is largely an unknown component in the overall context of usability. I know there's more to his resume than just this, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Hakkinen. So, uh, thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you for uh, coming to this uh, symposium. It's a it's a good topic audience and. Not an audience I, I typically talk to because I focus a lot on, on the visually impaired community. So I hope you find this an interesting uh, presentation and look at some of the things that we do in that context and how it might apply to learning disabled students also. So can you hear me okay on the mic? Okay. So I uh, switch this over magically. Oh, it was already switched over, right? Or, there, it is. there it is. Okay. So I have to look up and look there everywhere. So I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is accessibility and assistive technologies, but really focusing on some emerging technologies. In order to get to some of the emerging technologies, you might have to go back in time to look at some things. So uh, stay tuned for what I hope will be an interesting presentation. I have some live demonstrations. I like to always live very dangerously with live demonstrations. So if you're actually looking at what I see in front of me right now, it would be rather frightening because there are cables and devices and things that we hope will all work when it comes time. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, have some audience participation and have a couple of you come up and try to look at some of these things and, and give the audience your feedback on it. So, um, I grew up watching a lot of science fiction films. I had this vision of a, of a future that I was going to grow up into as an adult with all these wonderful, fantastic things. Um, there was this, this film from the 30s called Things to Come. A lot of it didn't come to pass, unfortunately. Um, so uh, sometimes you have to be careful what we might wish for or think might be awaiting us as we, as we age. Um, sometimes things can be surprising. Sometimes objects in the future may actually be closer than you think they are. And so sometimes we're surprised by things that just magically appear. Some of these things like iPads and iPhones are pretty impressive. However, if you go back and watch some early films like 2001 Space Odyssey from, from the late 60s, you'll notice that uh, the two astronauts on their uh, Discovery spaceship are looking at devices that are markedly like iPads. Um, they got that year wrong a little bit. That's supposed to be 2001, well, 2004 or 5 time frame. So, we move on. Uh, Star Trek, great film looking at a lot of future technology. So 23rd century, everybody had these little communicators. Well, well we, we did pretty well with all of our little communicators and smartphones, which I like to argue sometimes are becoming more like the tricorder as a device that lets us actually, from an accessibility perspective, transform information about our environment into different values. So I think, I think we're getting closer to some of the technologies from that model. It's, it's pretty exciting time to be living in. So there are some great statements out there about uh, the future. Uh, Alan Kay said the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Good thing to do. Uh, Aaron Hopper said the only way to predict the future is to have the power to shape it. Another good sentiment. And sometimes, we like to say, sometimes stuff just happens. Uh, so what does this all have to do with accessibility? Good question. <laughs> So accessibility, as many of us know, has driven significant innovation by solving problems for one group and benefiting many. The classic example is the curb cut. Um, probably people in wheelchairs that easily go up and down city streets, that's the sidewalk, but we all use curb cuts in many, many different ways. So um, 
the idea here is that by doing accessibility solutions, really helping to invent the future for a lot of other, other people. Um, I like to talk a lot about standards, and you're going to hear a lot about standards, and I mean technical standards in this case, not necessarily educational standards. And so that, these standards are very important from an interoperability perspective. It makes accessibility really work well now across different types of devices, but also to get new devices in the future. It's very important to think about technical standards, particularly in the accessibility space. And I call that shaping the future. So if we have good standards, we're also able to help ensure that as new technologies arrive, we can have a, a good chance of having them be quite accessible to a, a broad audience. So I think I'll switch over to this device and not the, uh, okay. Go forward. Okay, here we go. Come on. So uh, the key thing about standards, and that's something I'll try to get to as we get toward the end of the presentation, they're most effective if you have the full scope of the stakeholders involved. It's not just the technology geeks who are sitting there defining standards. You really need to have everyone from the end users through to the technologists. And so that's really an important point that we don't want to forget the people we're actually designing these standards for. And I can say, having been in the assistive technology field for a very long time, sometimes we don't always think about the actual end users when we build new innovative technologies. And we get to the word innovation. And so the innovation meme is all over the place. Every company wants to innovate. And so I think about innovation more like sometimes really good ideas just happen. So I'm from ETS. We do tests. So I have to quit. It's not hard. So I like to ask a question. I know Ben was talking about typewriters. And so why was the first typewriter invented? The first work of the typewriter invented? Anybody want to answer that question? No volunteers. You're not being okay. Was it for deaf people? Uh, no, not for deaf people. So, uh, any other takers? Newspapers? Newspapers? No. We're yeah, actually going. No. Uh, let, 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 let's let's give the answer. Uh, the first typewriter that's been proven to have actually worked was built by an Italian named uh, Pellegrino Turi, and it was in 1808. And he had a, a friend, or shall I say, love interest, who was visually impaired. And he wanted to come up with a way for her to write letters. So she couldn't handwrite because she was visually impaired. So he developed a, a very primitive but workable typewriter. And in doing this technology development, he actually also developed carbon paper. Anybody know what carbon paper is? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know what a typewriter is? <laughs> so, so yeah, so that, that's one of the technology. So that, that goes back, you know, several hundred years. But let's take a look at something else. So what's the origin of predictive text entry on cell phones? We you know, I'd say most of you here will, will, will send a text message from a cell phone. And most of you will sometimes benefit or suffer from predictive text entry. I know I have suffered sometimes for some, some embarrassing word selections that I didn't really monitor. So anybody know how this technology originated? Okay. Didn't that come in from what, programs like CoWriter early, early, early? Um, As assistive yeah. technology. Yeah. Yes, and so the the real developer of what well, became initially called T9 was Cliff Kushler, who developed this technology as a method for people with, with communication difficulties to be able to communicate more efficiently. So, make the process of, of creating sentences and words more efficient. And what's been very interesting is that Cliff keeps innovating, and he's behind this technology called Swipe, which you can now also get on your iPhone as, as an alternate keyboard. So these are technologies that had an origin from an accessibility or a disability perspective and have become very mainstream. And I think uh, Ben was pointing out that we have these features in the iPhone and iOS devices, which are great accessibility features, but we find people who are not necessarily with a disability using these features. So, uh, good developments. Um, anybody recognize what this is? It's a Braille. Is that a Braille note ticket? Yes. So, so there's this great museum in Boston, in Watertown, at the Perkins School for the Blind. And this is just an early Braille uh, writer from the Perkins Museum. 
and others may recognize a more modern version of it, but it's quite, quite dated. But we're moving into new types of technology capabilities. And so we have here an example of a prototype from Stanford University, which was an on-screen on Braille keyboard. So you can actually type the corded Braille entry on a touch screen. Um, now Apple has an iOS 8, a new feature which includes a Braille input keyboard. is one of the keyboards you can select on the iPhone and iPads really cool way that they're seeing this technology morph into being available on off-the-shelf consumer devices, which I think is a very key development. So uh, let's look at some emerging technology, some of the things that, that I get excited about when I'm, I'm working in, in, in research at ETS. So again, to go back, to go forward, we have to look back sometimes. And so this here is a page from an 1860 book on Euclidean geometry. It's also at the Perkins uh, Library Museum. And it is a book that is tactile. All the geographic or geometric figures on there are stitched with black thread. And so as you move your hand over that surface, you can feel the geometric shapes. And as someone who spent a lot of his life working on, on talking book standards and ebook standards, I've always wondered, how can we do something like this in a modern ebook? And so we'll get to that in a couple of moments. So I like to talk about making images accessible. How do we take an image and make it understandable by someone who's non-visual? And so we look at uh, images and ebooks and assessments. Uh, images are a major component of STEM content, the science, technology, engineering, and math materials. And so it's typically a technique where we have someone who may be visually impaired, we'll look at providing verbal descriptions, what we may often call the long description of an image that allows the student to understand what that image uh, consists of. We're also looking at physical tactiles that might be created, much like that hand-stitched uh, page in the book. But when we look toward more dynamic kinds of learning materials, the simulations that are becoming more and more a part of the learning materials that students see in textbooks and on online systems, how do you make those kinds of things accessible in a way that someone who's a non-visual learner will be able to um, understand them? So one of the techniques that is currently out there is tactile embosser. So these are devices that will produce an embossed image. And I'll show a picture of one in a minute. Um, they can do it on demand, but again, it's really a static image. It's not something that's going to be dynamic. You have to wait for it to print out. It can take a minute or two minutes to print out this tactile image. Um, they're static, so they don't change. If you want to look at a dynamic simulation, you have to create a flip book of these tactile images. Uh, not really an ideal solution. And of course, cost is a limiting factor. These tactile embossers can cost $6,000, $7,000. So it's often funny to look at how these assistive technologies are many, many thousands of dollars working with a $500 iPad. It's just this discrepancy of, of technology. It'd be great if we had a way to do tactile on a mainstream device. <coughs> And this is just an example of a tactile embossed output of a simple line graph. It's from a uh, Tiger uh, dot plus printer that also overprints an ink, which is actually very useful so you can have a sighted uh, uh, teacher work with a blind student and really understand what might be on the visual display. And it just consists of raised dots that are pushed through the paper. So um, what's next though? So we have these technologies based on paper, what do we do in the future? What are the things coming along? So I'm going to touch on several different technologies. One's called sonification, using sound to present visual information and data. We'll also look at some technologies such as large format braille displays. Very exciting potential if we can drop the cost. Uh, 3D printing. How many people have 3D printers or have access to them? Oh good, a good percentage, excellent. Um, then we'll talk about smart images, a new concept that we're, we're trying to talk about, how to make images like smart. They're self-accessible. They contain all the information that you might need to, to provide accessibility in different modalities. And finally, my, my favorite topic and the focus of my research at ETS, haptics. So let's just move on here. So, um, so my focus is on visual impairments, but I want you to think about how these ideas and technologies can apply to other context such as students with learning disabilities. Um, in particular, when we think about multimodality, we initially think about, for example, text and audio, synchronized text and audio. But what happens if you introduce tactile modalities as part of the multimodal 
presentation process. So think about that, and I'll have an opportunity to have you try some of these multimodal technologies. I hope it's all still working. Um, so sonification. I almost think sonification is a bit old school already in terms of my, in my perception of it. We can generate sound very readily in, in computer-based platforms. It's really finding a way to do it effectively, however, is still a challenge. And so sonification really means using sound to represent data. And a good example of that is an audio graphing calculator, which is something that will have a spoken interface, as well as being able to present graphs in a audio form, meaning as you go through a sine wave, you'll hear a tone vary with the uh, values of the current point of the sine wave. Very interesting technology. And if I can actually uh, be brave enough to switch to a web browser. OK, so this is a standard web page built for something called uh, SVG and HTML5. It's something that runs on Google Chrome, it could run on Firefox, it could run on other, other browsers across Mac and Windows platforms, and even on iPads. Uh, very simple stuff. Uh, what it does, however, is uses sonification to allow you to look at the image. I'm using the keyboard to navigate. Numbers. And this is, a, this is an example done by uh, Doug Shepherds, who works at the Worldwide Web Consortium. And let me just actually uh, tell that to go quiet now. Um, So, um, it's, <laughs> so you don't need actual complex technology or like a specialized device. You can start implementing uh, sonification of, of graphics using standards in web browsers today. It becomes very simple and what we're hoping to see before too long are some standard toolkits that people who are building math content for the web can draw upon to say, I need to sonify this graph and make it. Uh, usable by someone who might be non-traditional, but what's the implication for also sonifying information for students who learn differently? How might that help their understanding of content? And I think it's particularly interesting perhaps in the math domain. So uh, that's one I think, sonification. It's, it's, it's readily achievable and it's uh, becoming quite available because it's built into web browsers. Um, again, that was uh, Doug Shepard's example. <coughs> Uh, large format braille display. A bit more interesting because we have seen a need to be able to present graphics to blind students. We have the paper tactile. The uh, paper tactiles are not dynamic. Uh, the printers are expensive. So when we look at the potential of having a large format braille display, and I don't know how many people have seen refreshable braille displays. Here's one. Uh, I'm quite uh, casual with it, even though it costs close to $3,000. This is a braille display that has only one line of braille cells and 40 characters. You really can't display graphics on this. Or if you do display graphics, it'll be a rather painful process to scroll through the image to actually see it. It's only designed for text. So when we look at saying, could we build a, a display that has many, many lines of these rising and falling dots that we use to display graphics, you say, yes, you can do that, but it's going to cost you $25,000 to build a, a device. And so that's really the barrier. I've seen some really great prototypes from around the world which are full-page Braille displays, and, and the costs are just astronomical. You'll never see these in a classroom or in someone's home. So there's been a sort of what I call the search for the holy Braille, um, and that is really a, a device that's going to be low cost. And so there's a very interesting project that's been uh, sponsored out of the National Braille Press, also in Boston. And they've developed essentially a large scale, uh, large format braille display using something called shape memory alloys. This is metal that changes its shape when you apply heat or current to it. And that can dramatically lower the cost of a large page display. And I have an image of it here. Uh, this is a prototype. It's got a lovely wood case. It's got sort of a retro look to it, but it's very, very sophisticated technology. And they're able to actually start bringing the cost of a large format display down to around $5,000. Still astronomical from a, from a technology cost perspective for many, many people. But we're getting to the point that they can go into mass production of this, we'll see the price drop. And for kids who are really in the STEM fields, people who are professional, who are non-visual, who need to have access to graphics, this might become a very powerful device for them. 
So 3D printing. Uh, for those of you who have 3D printing, you, you know what I'm going to talk about, basically. Uh, it's a great device for creating physical manipulatives, models, things that a student can actually touch and, and feel and look at. And we really sort of like the potential of this. You can think about a history book that might talk about the Roman Colosseum and has a little button you can put it to say, print me a model of the Roman Colosseum so I can actually look at it and see what it looks like up close. Uh, it's great technology. Uh, one of the issues, though, is that even though they're so exciting, they tend to be expensive, but those costs are dropping again. They tend to be slow. It's not going to be something that just instantly you know, replicates something. <coughs> it's going to take time to print. We're also looking that at some point we see the cost will drop further and the speeds will increase. And this is just an example of a carbon atom that was 3D printed. Uh, very, very interesting uh, capability to be able to give a student a model they can then manipulate, especially if they're visually impaired and you can look at the model rather than have it described to them, understand the electron rings. Um, here's a model of a human brain that has tactile features as well as braille and symbology that a student, again, can use to understand the structure of the human brain. <coughs> this was, again, done by National Braille Press, along with Massachusetts General Hospital. And this one, I, I really like, this is a project out of India called Fiddles. And they're essentially little braille learning tools that let you put together braille characters to form shapes which correspond to the word that's being defined in braille. So here's a fish with the braille text fish. And these are essentially open source type models that you can go ahead and download <coughs> for your students. And I, I think these are really great uh, uh, potential possibilities to be able to just print a whole set of these for, for a child. And if you ever uh, go through the, who knows about Kickstarter? Okay, again, how many people have funded Kickstarter projects? Oh, good, good, I love it. Um, so here's one of the many 3D printers that have been on Kickstarter. This one, I think, is slated to be around $299, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'll, I'll believe it when I actually see it delivered to me. Uh, I, I funded Kickstarter things which have never come. Um, they had to apologize at some point because they couldn't pull it off. But we're hoping that many of these things do, do make uh, through into uh, practice and reality. Um, smart image descriptions. This is something that I find really exciting because it's really, when we look at interactive content, we look at, at very dynamic uh, e-textbooks, for example, with simulations. How do you expose, for example, the water cycle, which has got a nice animation of the water flowing through from evaporation back down the rain into the water, into the rivers, and so on. Um, you can provide a verbal description of that, a very long static long description that can be read out loud, but what if you could actually allow a student to sort of explore this image bit by bit and say, I'm going to go look at the river now, and the river can sort of self-describe what the river is, what it's doing. Go to the cloud, and you can learn about the cloud has this density of water in it that's causing it to fall in its rain. So one of the things that we've discussed in a project at what's called the Diagram Center, which is being hosted by Benetech, and you know Benetech from its Bookshare uh, uh, project. Uh, the Diagram Center is really looking at image description standards. How do we get publishers, and in my perspective, the assessment companies like EPS, to start building in images that have very good descriptive information that can be translated potentially into a spoken form, into a tactile form for an embosser, for a 3D printer, or for potentially haptics, as we'll talk about. Uh, Diagramcenter.org is a great place to go learn about the whole process of image description and also get involved in that discussion. Uh, they have a brand new, as of uh, earlier this year, image sample book, which shows you various kinds of image descriptions, as well as how you implement those in various technologies, such as HTML or EPUB. So it's, it's really an excellent resource if you want to sort of focus on uh, how you actually make images accessible. So we'll go on now to haptics. Um, haptics, by definition, is of or relating to the sense of touch or tactile. It is essentially the creation of providing active feedback that says, I'm actually touching some physical feature without actually touching that object. Um, it's really a virtual tactile, as I like to call it. Um, there are many different ways to deal with haptics. Uh, how many of you have seen a Novin Falcon 3D game controller? 
It's been used by uh, a number of groups looking at how we can make simulations accessible to the visually impaired. It really was designed as a 3D haptic game controller for first-person shooter games. Um, so you could feel the recoil of guns as you fire them and bounce into walls and such. It's, the intent was rather, I, I think, uh, not what we really wanted to do from an accessibility perspective. And so uh, uh, Marjorie Jarrett, West Virginia, has been doing a lot with building accessible science simulations or science objects using the Nova Falcon. We did a project late last year where we were lo looking at the Nova Falcon as a way to explore states of matter. So we have a, a science assessment task where students are led through a series of, of uh, introductions to states of matter, looking at how molecules change their behavior from a solid to a liquid to a gaseous form. And trying to describe that with pure words to a blind student can be rather challenging. So we were looking at different ways we could use haptics to allow a child to explore a vessel containing a liquid, uh, a solid, a gas. And so moving this sort of, think about a 3D mouse. So you're moving this 3D mouse around a, a vessel, which you see on the screen there, and that uh, little cluster of molecules at the bottom is sort of the, the frozen solid. And so as you move your 3D mouse around, you bounce, bounce into the molecules. You'll, you'll feel the molecule. You feel that here's a mass of things. And once the molecules get more energetic in the liquid form or a gaseous form, you can put your mouse, let's say, in the middle of the little container, and you'll be bounced. You'll feel bouncing as the molecules hit you. And so it's very interesting technology, but some of the kids that we, we presented this to found this like rather clunky. It's, it's, it's like cool, but it's sort of an abstraction also between the concept and, and what you're really trying to trying to present to the, to, to the student. So it, it's cool, but well, maybe that's not the way we want to go for the long term, to look at alternatives. Um, another approach is what we call vibrotactile feedback. And any of you who let your phone on silent and feel your phone vibrate, that's fibrotactile feedback. Uh, I think every smartphone and most other cell phones have fibrotactile feedback for the messaging feature. Uh, many Android tablets have fibrotactile feedback, but you wouldn't really know it unless you like, turn it on, you feel a sort of buzz when you turn on the Android tablet. Um, what is, how this works basically is little piezoelectric motors that create a vibration whenever a piece of software tells it to vibrate. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that it's not precise. It vibrates the whole tablet. So the whole surface vibrates, for example. But it's a cool technology, and we think it might have some promise for accessibility beyond just providing a learning function. And so um, these are some piezoelectric motors. You can see what, how big they are. They're not very big. Um, the one on the left I took out of a Nokia phone just to sort of see what that vibrator it had within it. The other one is one I bought for about three dollars from a Radio Shack. Yeah, they're very inexpensive uh, bits of technology, but they have very interesting potential, especially when they're built into ubiquitous devices that all of us have in our pockets or, or uh, in the case of a tablet in our, our briefcase or in our hands. So uh, fiber tactile graphics has been a, a research interest of mine as well as many other researchers. Uh, there's a group down in Australia at Monash University. There's a group at the uh, uh, University of Beirut. Uh, there have been groups at Vanderbilt and a few other places looking at fiber tactile haptics. Um, looks quite promising in many ways. What we've been able to do is put together on-screen <coughs> visual stimuli such as line graphs and geometric shapes. And when a uh, hand is touching the shape, you feel a vibration. And so it's, it seems to be quite effective for some types of graphics, but not, not everything. Uh, and here's an example of it. Here's my sort of simulated tablet. And you see a, a, a straight line on the screen. And here, a little indicator here, which sort of serves as the vibration effect, because I'm not going to shape the room when, when, <laughs> when you're feeling the vibration. So if, we, if this simulation works correctly, you'll uh, uh, see as the hand touches the line, the vibration motor triggers. And so you get a sense, oh, I found something on the screen. And so as you begin moving your finger around the surface, you begin to identify that there's something on the screen that only vibrates when it's um, in contact with it. And so we've done a number of usability studies, uh, both in uh, the US as well as in Finland. And we've worked with blind students. And they can 
identify shapes. Square is relatively easily identified. Line orientations are great. You can basically identify it's a positive slope line, negative slope line, straight line, vertical, such. Uh, fairly promising in that regard. Uh, one of the things, though, that I'll talk about in a minute is that most blind students like to explore tactiles with more than one finger. The capability of vibrotactile is not supporting multiple fingers because it vibrates the whole surface. So you really have to teach the student to use one finger when you're working with this technology. Not ideal. That's an example of one of our stimuli. And um, if I'm brave here, um, I have the tablet. And here, somebody wants to step and try it just to vouch to the audience that it does work. Um, OK. Yeah, just you hold the tablet and use a single finger and just move over the surface. What do you feel? I do feel the vibration when I go over the line. Can I get close to the side? Yeah, I, I I have done this with smaller smaller groups. I'll pass it around for everyone, but uh, I'll have it available during the lunch break for people to look at. Uh, it's it's just a, a very basic. And this is an off-the-shelf Android tablet. Uh, it's a Toshiba tablet, and uh, this little white cover on it. Is just we've had it when we were doing our usability studies with, with younger students, so they don't go ahead and start touching the various Android navigation controls. So we're really interested not in their skill in navigating Android, but their ability to identify geometric shapes. And very clever, I'll sell these little foam core covers if you're interested. Um, okay, so uh, here's another. Um, study we were doing, I talked about the Novit Falcon, where we were looking at the states of matter. We also explored, could we represent those molecule patterns on a 2D tablet surface, again using the, the haptic feedback. We, we actually ran a small study comparing paper tactile versions of those molecules with the vibration version and then the Novit Falcon. And uh, it, early results, but I think we'll see that with, with further development, we'll get uh, fairly good identification. We can have students actually count the number of molecules, which I found interesting. Since this was a static presentation, there was no sense of movement in this case. We were really asking them to identify. Can you tell us something about the molecule state, the state of the molecules in the vessel? And they could. And we did something uh, uh, early on that was a bit more elaborate. We had a what we call the C-ball science tasks, where we asked students to learn about proportions and ratios. And so we have a, a task where a student is mixing a fruit punch and they're dropping powder and liquid into a, a pitcher and they're asked to, to identify uh, the proper ratio. And so what we did just as a way to augment the presentation for both visually impaired and sighted students was to add a haptic feedback so they could move their finger around the surface and when they hit the thermometer they could feel uh, the level of the thermometer as well as in the pitcher the vibration intensity would vary based upon density of the fruit punch. And so these are additional cues as part of that multimodal presentation that might be interesting. Again, this was this is just a, a prototype we put together. We didn't really evaluate it uh, beyond just looking at, gee, what could we do with haptics in this type of task? Uh, can I ask you something? Yes. So this is a very high sensitive device. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that we received two minutes at France. So one of the NSF grants is actually a, um, it's a science, yeah. it's a um, science <coughs> video game, but uh, students are implicitly learning principles of Newtonian physics, and what they're doing is moving particles in different media, yes. and obviously in a more viscous form, it'll move slower, so you need to uh, adjust your trajectory of hitting something. Um, and what we're looking at is behind the scene uh, data, big data of eye gaze, uh, how long are you on a particular screen, yes. how long does it take you to learn these implicit principles of science to then identify learning patterns and if there are differences in patterns among different profiles of learners. So it's very interesting that uh, you're taking this in another direction in terms of accessibility. Right, I, I think one of the questions is, Sometimes these accessibility features might, might improve engagement, make the task more engaging for the student. Yeah. And so, much like video games can add haptic effects 
as that first person shooter model did, we can also find it from doing uh, science simulations. Uh, so we have another project we did this year, actually it's still in progress. We said, could we take the haptic effect and embed it directly within an ebook? And so the uh, Diagram Center gave us a small amount of funding to say, could we take an EPUB 3 standard book that would be playable with a EPUB reader on an Android tablet and have it uh, include haptics? And so we started with a simple concept book on geometric shapes. And we are doing some pilot testing this fall with visually impaired students. And I have a picture of it here. It's all based on standards. It's all, there's no magic to it from a technology point. You take an off-the-shelf Android tablet, you take an off-the-shelf ebook reader like Medium, which is an open source reader, and you take an EPUB book, which has all got standards-based stuff in it. And you end up with a book that can look like this. This is Medium on an Android tablet, talking about what's a circle. And then we have a circle. As you move your finger over the surface, you'll feel the shape, the border, and the different fill vibration on the circle. And so it's all doable. And I keep thinking, it'd be really cool to do Pat the Bunny with haptics. Haptics <laughs> <laughs> was a lot more interesting from a tactile uh, sensation. Uh, one of the other things we've been, we've been discussing, and this is something we've been discussing with uh, a colleague back in Finland, Hakey Hake Lutton, who does a lot of dyslexia research, is could we combine haptics with on-screen reading to help identify word boundaries, combine the audio, the textual presentation, as well as some feedback as you move over words to help identify syllable breaks and such. And so that's one of the things that we're very excited about looking at in the near future. We have a prototype, but I didn't bring it with me, but it'll be something to talk about at a later time. Um, so vibrotactile graphics are, are, are pretty good. We there are some issues with the vibrotactile technique. There is a learning curve, particularly when you want to encourage students to use only one finger when their uh, habit is to use multiple fingers for physical tactiles. We think that's not a big issue. They, they basically can overcome that in a single session and start using a single finger. But we'd love to be able to do multi-touch because that really is a more natural way to explore physical objects. Um, one thing we found is that the vibration feedback in the devices varies from vendor to vendor. There's no standards for that. And another thing, I don't know if John Landis from Apple is here yet, but Apple does not have any kind of haptic feedback on the iPad yet. And so I, I think they filed some patents in this space, but we haven't seen anything appear in an actual product yet. But we'll be excited when it does. Um, going forward, what we're going to be doing is making tools and sample code to allow teachers and students to start exploring this technology if they have an Android tablet, for example, that supports vibrotactile feedback. We also want to take a look at putting guidelines out there and say, if you're going to use this technology, here's the data that we have that can inform how you want to use this effectively with your students. And we're going to keep evaluating new emerging technologies, which is the next part of this, this presentation. One of these is called electrostatic feedback. And I have a electrostatic tablet here. And then there's also low-cost wearable haptics. Anybody have a Fitbit? Have a Fitbit. Any of those that when you clap, your Fitbit might start vibrating, think you're going to sleep? Uh, anyway, uh, I've noticed that when I go to conferences. Fitbit has a vibrotactile uh, feedback motor in it, and it's used to tell you you've reached your 10,000 steps and other things, and wake you up if you use the alarm feature. So wearable haptics are actually very cool things, and we're doing some things in our, our lab with them. Um, well, first off, electrostatic. Electrostatic is a technology that really varies the surface friction on a touchscreen display. So you're moving your finger over the glass, and your glass, your finger will feel like you're touching a texture or a hard surface. It's really a perceptual mind trick that's very cool. So electrostatic lets you feel texture on a glass surface. It's about 18 to 24 months away from being in mainstream tablets, but it's, it's becoming more robust. And uh, I have a, a electrostatic prototype tablet here. And one of the coolest apps that, that we have for this tablet is an app that allows you to look at a photo. We can't see this. Okay, I know I missed my back up. <laughs> That's ETS intruding on my life. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I'll have someone to come up and see it. We look at it all during the lunchtime break. But uh, here you have an image of a, a monkey. And as you move your finger over the surface, You'll feel, you feel where the eyes are, you can feel the different textures right on the surface. 
and it's just amazing. But we're looking at how this can be used to augment all parts of the user interface on this tablet. Um, we're looking at using our, our line graph stimuli as well as our geometric shapes. We're looking at all sorts of interactive simulations that could benefit from being able to vary the surface texture. Really amazing stuff. It also has a limitation of being single touch, but we've been talking uh, to the people who developed the technology, and they're also in Finland. I have a Finnish connection, if you didn't, didn't know. Uh, and so we're looking at ways that could maybe allow multi-touch, to allow multiple fingers to feel different textures on the screen. So uh, it's pretty cool. And who would like to come and try this? And it won't shock you, so. <laughs> yes, that's right. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so yeah it's, it's the tongue is rougher than the other parts. You can feel the eyes. There. Yeah. Actually, you can actually focus on it. Goodness. So, wow. So, so this, this is like very I first saw this technology in, in the lab at this small company in Finland about three years ago. I said, this is this is like game changing from an accessibility perspective. And and they were talking to me initially. I kept calling them whenever I was in Finland and uh, They'd say, we don't have time to talk, we don't have time to talk. And finally, I caught the CTO during lunch hour. He made the mistake of answering the phone. And I explained to him why I was interested in the technology. He come on over right now. And, and I did, and I just tried it out. I said, this is so cool. And it's taken three years to actually get a close to an off-the-shelf unit that incorporates this. This is the Google Nexus 7 tablet. This is the thing. doesn't mean that Google's going to have this, but they're using a Google Nexus 7 tablet to do the final proof of concept before they go into manufacturing. And uh, they keep telling us there will be some mainstream tablet vendors going to have this at their device. So fingers crossed, it's, it's really cool. And it's really great for like typing. They have great examples of like text editing, being able to do selection of text, and you can actually feel the letters move over the text. It's cool but, stuff. I can see even just beyond accessibility, engagement. Yeah, that part. Students it, it, the, the venture capitalists back in this company have no interest in accessibility. It's like venture capitalists don't care about accessibility. And so, but the CTO is a neuroscientist and he cares about accessibility. But the mainstream market for this is like automotive touch screens, uh, mainstream consumer devices <laughs> that help improve these on screen keyboards. But it's, it's cool technology, and uh, we're going to be doing, uh, we just submitted an IES proposal for next year, which will really dive into this technology and do some larger scale studies to say, how will this work? One of the concerns that I have is that in our pilot studies with this in Finland, kids have different finger sensitivity, and not everybody feels the same effect mm -hmm. in the same way. And so we really want to understand whether that was an artifact of an early prototype, or whether it's something that might be a more consistent uh, challenge. Yeah, how can we come? But it's, it's cool technology. Um, and some of the wearable stuff. Um, this is an early, uh, this is like the first wearable haptic ring prototype that I put together. Um, that's, I think it's probably now close to two and a half years ago. And what it is essentially, uh, it's a Velcro strap holding one of those vibration uh, motors on my fingertip. And the eventual goal for me was to have multiple haptic rings on my fingers and no bells on my toes. Um, and, but I could then explore graphic images and actually have the vibration transmitted into my finger directly and that will allow me to have multiple fingers on the display. Uh, there's a group that I mentioned in Australia who's doing haptic gloves for the same kind of approach. And so I think it's very promising and uh, again it's a technique that, that may allow this multi-finger exploration to be much more effective. But this becomes more of a specialized device for non-visual users or an assistive technology that could be relatively low cost if it uses Bluetooth capabilities. So that's one approach. The other approach that, that we were exploring earlier this year is uh, how many people know what a leap motion device is? A leap motion, okay good. A leap motion is a small little device costs around $70. Uh, I think HP's building them into some of their uh, uh, laptops and, and computers. What it does is it lets you track finger motion and gestures. And so you basically put this little bleep motion controller on your desk in front of your monitor and you can do things like wave and uh, point the things and it will track your finger motion. And so one thing that's very good at tracking is like a single finger pointing. 
And so we were looking earlier at, could we take a typical uh, tablet stylus and put a vibration motor or a series of motors in this stylus and allow a student who has an iPad, which has no haptics, to get haptic feedback using some of the same standard techniques we were using. And so, so we prototyped it, it worked. And then one day we were saying, gee, that's, what if we use that with the leap motion? And so we started looking at, could we put shapes up in like a virtual augmented reality model and point to it and you can feel when you're contacting. And so, it, yeah, it works. Pretty cool. It's, it's a real jury rig system though. And, uh, because of the leap notion requirements, we're running off of a Microsoft Surface tablet. If anybody's ever seen one of those? Uh, that's not too common, but it's, it's a good tablet. It works the leap motion, and then we have some some digital hardware hidden in the background that actually interfaces with the stylus, makes it all work. But again, it's all standard space model. Uh, the images are all done with SVG. There's a lot of JavaScript involved and some, some specialized code right now because the browsers don't do exactly what we need yet. But these types of things are really possible. And again, might make for more engaging experiences for every student, not just someone with a disability. So, cool stuff. Leap Motion is a very interesting device. So, one of the things that we're also looking at, uh, rethinking magnification. Uh, that's something that comes up a lot in the assessment context. How do you support the needs of low vision students? We have some models that are typically based off of like a magnifying glass or a Microsoft microscope model, excuse me. And from the perspective of a low vision user, and once I talk to say, it's like looking through content, trying to read through a straw. You know, you're going over these long lines of text that go back, and it's very, very cumbersome. And so there's a lot of horizontal panning needed to get through text. And so, um, Again, looking at, at standards, primarily standards of the World Wide Web, we might have other ways to do that. And so one of the things is to use cascading style sheets. Style sheets are what make all those web pages really pretty and colorful and different typographic settings. Uh, CSS gives you a lot of typographic control. So it might be interesting for dyslexic readers also. Uh, Responsive design, something that's being driven by the use of web pages across ranges of screen sizes, is also very interesting for being able to read flow content to make it more readable. And so we can also look at not necessarily magnifying things, but just enlarging the text and reflowing it to eliminate this horizontal scrolling need. And um, might lead to easier reading. And so I have a low vision experiment. And if I can get back to my web browser again, just do that quickly. And okay. So just this is very quickly. This again is just standard JavaScript and style sheets and, and the Chrome browser works in Firefox too. And um, what we can do is do things like adjust the uh, text size, obviously. We can do manipulations of character spacing, word spacing, line spacing. We can choose different typefaces. Uh, we can choose something like the dyslexia font. And then we can put all of this away. And we can also do color changes, but I'll, I'll spare you that at this point. Um, let me close that up. And uh, so we can change the content, change the size. And another really cool thing, this alludes back to some of the things that, that Ben was saying earlier, the text-to-speech capabilities. Uh, there are new standards for using text-to-speech within JavaScript on web browsers. And so I can do a real quick demo of that. Uh, let me just use the this product? What, what is this? There's no product. This is just programming with JavaScript on your web browser. And we're hoping that we can start open sourcing some of these code samples we've already put together so people can start using them. Uh, again, this just is sort of showing capability. Uh, let me run just the uh, text-to-speech. You don't have to hear, but you can get the idea. Um, um, this is all happening without any specialized assistive technology. This is, again, just using capabilities that are now standard space built into web browsers that if you know how to write the JavaScript, you can do it. Uh, it's a very great capability. Works, again, across Mac OS, uh, Windows, and on the uh, tablet devices. It's, it's just very interesting to know. Still no JavaScript. 
Oh, there we go. We're looking, yeah, the thing that we'd like to do, I, I had a meeting with a dyslexia group in Finland uh, in August, and they're looking at potentially taking the open source code that we started with and adapting it into a plugin for Google Chrome, for example. So that we could then yeah. use and yeah. reduce yes. without knowing Yes. Yeah, you don't have to, again, we're just looking at, the thing that's been really great for us is that the standards community, such as the World Wide Web Consortium, are building these capabilities into web browsers. Yeah. And it's and so we have access to these tools now to be now the creative fun people who can who can write code and build some really great tools uh, for end users. So it's just around the corner. Just around the corner. It's, it's in the browsers now as a capability that can now be exercised. So let me go back to uh, slides. We'll try to keep this on time here. So what you're saying is the Java code is actually just the interface that they create. Yes. Capability is there, just the, access yeah, to the, access. the access to the speech, the access to the speech, synthesizers, the access to what we call the, the word boundary callbacks. You can do the highlighting. The style sheets are used to control the highlighting. You can you can you can have a lot of fun experimenting with highlighting styles, which no one has really done a lot of research on. But now it's it's very easy to do that. Um, so let me try to find my actual PowerPoint here. Um, I was very good with this um, right now, getting back to the right uh, presentation. There we are. Okay, so uh, this is just a prototype that we're working with. So we're trying to support low vision needs, but also potential needs of uh, learning disabled students as we, as we delve into this further. Um, so now for the really fun part, Google Glass. Um, how many people have, have tried Google Glass? Anju has, of course. You have. Um, a few others, maybe. Um, so Google Glass is a very interesting technology. I, I don't consider it really ready for prime time yet for a lot of reasons because of battery life being my biggest complaint, but it's, it shows some real potential. And we'll try to do a couple of things here with it. Uh, some of the things that, that I've seen possible on, on list, what Google's talked about, are things that you can do with glass or glass-like technologies. Things that might be useful such as face direction detection. You know, are you looking at someone if you can't see the person? Uh, Real-time closed captioning, and there's a great video I'll try to show you in a minute about that. Visual alerts of loud noises in your environment if you can't hear. Uh, obstacle detection, so if you know that there's some ob obstacle in front of you, it can alert you if you're, again, visually impaired. Uh, magnification of words or objects, and I just uh, installed a magnification app for my Google Glass, but I can't get it to work. So I would have shown that if I could get it to work. The idea of being able to look at an object and have a magnified version appear before you with Google Glass is quite interesting. Uh, navigation for pedestrians, being able to give you guidance. Uh, uh, color shifters, if you have a, a, a visual impairment where you want to shift the visual uh, appearance. Color identifier, uh, these are all things possible. Scene description, sonification. Uh, a guy named Peter Meyer in, in Holland has done some great things with a thing called The Voice. He's adapted now to the uh, Google Glass that can sonify, create a soundscape of whatever you might be looking at. Uh, language translation, there's an app for that. Uh, object identification, being able to read barcodes or, or QR codes. Very cool technology. And uh, what I'll try to do, it doesn't have a set here, is this should work. And if it doesn't, we'll move on quickly from it. Um, <coughs> aha, okay, so let me get my glass on, and don't say anything rude about me, this is just for demonstration purposes, <laughs> and so you see on the window what I'm seeing, and so I'm going to actually go back, a lot of little gestures you use, come on, okay glass, take a picture, so took a picture, <laughs> and uh, so Glass has a lot of interesting capabilities like that, and I can share that, I can post that, but it's not on the Wi-Fi right now, so you'll all be spared that. Um, you can delete it, uh, you can do a lot of things. Um, but the interesting thing is, if I can get this app, come on now, go back here. Um, battery, okay. 
It's, it works very well, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> I, can say, I can talk to it. Um, well, you can try it during the break again. Um, but the thing that's interesting, it has a bone conducting uh, headset. So basically, you hear spoken feedback basically in your head because it's, it's using the contact between this part of the uh, Google Glass with your uh, uh, bone and then it transmits the sound vibrations directly to your ear, which is really cool. It has speech recognition, it has uh, a lot of different capabilities. And I'm going to show you actually a video that might be better than watching me try to do something with it. Um, let's go back to the slides and we'll come Mark, over. Once you're done with that, can you talk a little bit more about the face direction capabilities? Because I'm thinking for students on the spectrum, they'll like the Yes, that's, that's one of the really interesting applications. And I haven't seen one. I've seen some facial recognition work, but I haven't really seen an app yet. These are some of the ideas that have been put forward at what glass would be good for. Yeah. And so, yeah, so for, for kids on the spectrum, I think it's very interesting to give you those cues right. that you need. Right. And so, very interesting device. This is a, um, a video from Georgia Tech, which I think is perhaps one of the best Google Glass applications I've seen that is actually practical. And um, I think what we'll do is go to the video, because I think it's worth seeing. And I think it'll be here, and here, and um, again, we'll try to get the audio um, going nice and loud. And, um, Pretty short, but good. Start captions. Hey, Jen, how's it going? Hey, Jay, how are you today? Pretty good. I had a question about the classes you teach. I wanted to know if I could help you at all with the class. Oh, what a great offer, in fact. I'd like to show off Google Class and this application to class. How long have you been teaching here at Tech? Uh, Jay, I've been teaching here since 1991, about 22 years ago. I gotta head out right now, but I'll see you in class. All right, super duper, thanks. Bye bye. <laughs> So that, that's, that's an application where someone who is deaf is communicating with someone who's, who's, who's speaking using the Android phone to capture the speech, do the text-to-speech conversion, and send it to Google Glass so that the, the deaf participant in the conversation can hear by reading the captions in real time in their field of view. And it, it's like, it's a really a cool application. I think one of the ones that will be great for the, the uh, Glass users who are deaf. Um, there are other ones which I, I, I've seen which do the language translation. Uh, I haven't personally tried those. Uh, we've been doing some things. We have a, a, a new scientist joining us who's visually impaired, and so we've been looking at putting QR codes in the environment so that uh, rather than having to go and find Braille labels, they could use Glass or an Android or an iPhone to capture the QR codes, which encode co textual descriptions of what this part of the building is. For example, for the restrooms, it says, what's the layout of the restroom as you go into it? And so something like Glass would be great for that if you can automatically spot the uh, QR codes in the environment. So there's some really cool capabilities with Glass. I, I think it's great. I just don't think the hardware itself is really robust enough at this point for, for daily use by someone with a disability. But I think that will change. Version, version 2 will be interesting to see from Google. So, uh, to make all of this work, and I guess we're ending at noon, so we're, we're doing pretty good time-wise. To make it all work, I'd like to really focus on the importance of standards. And so, there's a wealth of accessibility, knowledge, and skills, and experience that has come from making the World Wide Web accessible. Uh, the, World, the Web Accessibility Initiative, which is hosted out of the W3C headquarters at MIT, have been doing phenomenal work in developing standards for accessibility and ensuring that the new web standards such as HTML5 and the video capabilities also incorporate built-in accessibility capabilities. And so uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who is the inventor of the World Wide Web, the actual web, the language HTML, and the servers that it ran upon, um, said that the power of the web is in its universality, accessed by everyone regardless of disabilities and the central aspect. And that's a driving force behind a lot of the groups that are working on the web today in the standard space. We have people engaged who are looking at what do we need for the visually impaired user? What do we need for the deaf user? 
I think one of the audiences that is not well represented in the web accessibility standards space are learning disabilities. And I really would like to try to encourage those who have the, the willpower and desire to go in and try to help shape standards to get involved. And if you want to, you can talk to me and I can help try to make that happen. I'll mention the opportunity in a few minutes that's, that's open now. So accessibility is successful because of the cooperation between the different parties involved, between the browser vendors, between the Microsofts, the Googles, the Apples, the, uh, the Mozilla people, as well as the content creators, uh, all these people working together to make sure that we get the accessibility supports built in. It doesn't always work smoothly. We've had a lot of problems. Uh, one of the greatest ones we've had recently is something called long description. How do we attach a long description to an image? About 17 years ago, we proposed a way to do it adding a long description property to an image. Still hasn't been adopted by the standards community. It's been a headache, and it's now going through another iteration. And I'm hoping that I will live to see the day when we actually have long descriptions as part of the web standard. But we're looking at other techniques that can be used, too. Um, accessibility is the basis of US legislation, whether it's IDEA, ADA, or Section 508. And so again, we all know about IDEA. Um, Elaborate on that. Um, ADA, again, American Disabilities Act, and very important, applying more and more to technology-based uh, circumstances, particularly websites. Uh, Section 508 is something that the federal government has as a essentially a set of technical requirements so that when governments procure technology, they have to factor in accessibility. And they should give preference to vendors who have accessibility built in rather than those who don't. And so with Section 508, you're really looking at the technical requirements for accessibility, and they're based, again, on these web accessibility standards. These web accessibility standards have become very important on a global scale for defining what it means to make technology accessible to a broad audience. So the new 508, which has been promised to come out now for several years, has a specific requirement that says requirement 502 of 508. Makes sense. Interoperability with assistive technology. Meaning that, again, technology that governments procure um, will have to be able to support assistive technologies or have it built in. Very key. So accessibility standards, there's some very mature accessibility standards out there right now. Um, they apply both to the content, such as the web content that someone writes, learning materials, and it also applies to the software, such as the web browsers. They have to be able to support these accessibility features. Uh, the standards are always evolving and improving. So just to rattle off some acronyms, because I always like to do that at some point. You know, so these are things which incorporate accessibility right into the standards themselves. So HTML has had accessibility features. HTML5, SVG is a scalable vector graphics format that's really great because you can take an image and embed <coughs> some accessibility information directly in the image. Uh, ben mentioned MathML. MathML is really great because now there are more and more assistive technologies that understand how to read the MathML and convert it into a spoken form understandable to the end user. Uh, ETS is a great research project called ClearSpeak, which is looking at different ways of rendering spoken math that will make it more understandable and usable. Uh, there are these web content accessibility guidelines, what we affectionately call WCAG. If you hear WCAG, that's, that's what it means. Uh, user agent guidelines, we need the web browsers, and then authoring tools that people might use to create content need to be accessible too. Uh, I, I think back to this picture from about 12 years ago, which was a prototype system that we've done for the Daisy Talking Book, just to show how effective these standards can be. This is a Daisy book, which was actually a, um, uh, uh, a children's story. Uh, it has uh, running on a, on a laptop under Windows and a Daisy player. It's driving the, the narrated, pre-recorded audio of a human narrator. It has a refreshable Braille display that's synchronized with the audio presentation showing the Braille text. It has a large print display on a separate monitor of the current text that's being read, all from a single standard. We didn't have to write a special version for Braille, a special version for audio, a special version for large print. A single, well-designed, accessible standard can give you these different modalities, and even at the same time. So one of the key things that we look at is structure and semantics. I don't have to dive too much into that. But when we look at people who are content authors, they tend to think visually. 
And what we want to do is focus on being able to take any content and move it into different modalities. So designers who think visually don't often think about the inner semantics, they think about the visual semantics. And what we want to do from a, a technology standards way is to make sure we capture all of those visual semantics in the underlying code of the HTML or the EPUB. And that gives us the opportunity to then translate that information into different modalities, reflow it, change its appearance, support navigation, which is very key when you start moving through content, especially not visually, but also for, for others who want to navigate very large structured textbooks. So structure and semantics is something I, I, I go on and on about sometimes. Uh, again, WCAG 2, I think it's important to understand a little bit about that. It's, again, a standard for the W3C. It forms the basis of Section 508, as well as many state standards now. Uh, from the ETS perspective, we get more and more RFPs for, for states looking for assessments that want WCAG compliance so that the test will be accessible. Um, guidelines are built around four key principles. Content needs to be perceivable by everyone. So if you can't see it, it needs to be perceivable to you in some modality. Uh, it needs to be operable. If you are paralyzed and have to use a, a, a switch interface, you should be able to interact with drag and drop interactions to the page or on a, on a textbook or a test item. It needs to be understandable to you. So if you can't uh, uh, have difficulty reading, you have difficulty with language, can that content be transformed in a way that works for you? And it needs to be robust so it works reliably. And there are different conformance levels for content. I'm not going to dive into that. It's too, too, much, too geeky at this point. Uh, <laughs> the standards are very clear. They're all on the web with links to examples of how to do that, how to implement the various guidelines. But there are some, still some challenges. One of the things I like to talk about is that we need to have good standards and best practices, especially focusing on different types of disabilities. Because one of the things that we see is this potential for fragmentation. Apple's doing things really well on their platform. Um, things aren't so good on the Windows 8 platform for, for built-in accessibility features. Google's got some good features too, but not very. What we want is an interoperable user experience. We just don't want interoperability of, of like an ebook that can work on all these different devices. We want the user experience to be interoperable too, so a student who learns how to do something doesn't have to relearn it when they go to a different device. So one of the things I think is helping is building these features for the mainstream devices. But we need to focus, I think, as Jen was alluding to earlier, they need to be discoverable. How do you, they're not buried so many layers down in a setting cell, but they need to be easily found, and they have to be usable. So uh, what I want to do is sort of challenge you, do you want to help? Um, we're bringing together different accessibility standards and vendors together, and AT experts, to work on assessment accessibility standards. Um, that's something that's uh, very exciting and something that's been ongoing now for uh, this past year. Uh, we're also conducting a lot of usability studies now and in the coming, coming years. And so again, if you're interested, if you have students who might be interested in participating in usability studies, it would be great if we get more learning disabled students involved in those studies. So my contact information's here. I'd be happy to talk to you. And so with that, um, I'm trying to go back one. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Okay. Can I go back on the slide? So, I'll, I'll take questions. No questions. We're running the Google Glass and QR code. We're trying to pay the folks with the Braille. Yeah, we, 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 we'd like to see some, some studies that are more environmental, not really in the interest of ETS to look at environmental accessibility standards, but we have some traffic interest that we want to make the environment work for all of our employees, whether they have uh, vision or not. So I, we, we have about doing some usability studies comparing how easy it is to use a QR code model with you know, traditional Braille. So, be a great study. We wish we had students in the We don't have students. Third question back there. Yeah. If we're trying to implement an accessible website or working with a designer to do that, where should we point them if we don't have the tech skills ourselves? The great place to start is to go to the W3C website. And it's very straightforward. Go to w3.org slash. W-A-I, which stands for the Web Accessibility Initiative. 
And that would be a, a good technical starting point for a web developer who wants to understand what accessibility means from an implementation standpoint. And you'll find links to all the standards, to the techniques, and other resources that are useful. A lot of, a lot of documents about understanding accessibility available there, too. Okay. Some example of what you call Jerry Rigging yeah. what's out there and offering help. Yeah. Uh, is that legal? <laughs> <laughs> it's research. Oh, it's research. It's okay. research. Oh, okay. Right. You know, uh, we, we break a lot of rules in research. And, okay. and so, uh, and I have to say, I started out, um, I, I said, I started out with some electrical engineering courses in my undergraduate years, so I was unafraid of hardware hacking at a very early age. And so, uh, and my, I should say, my father built a Heath Kit color TV when I was around seven years old. And so, uh, it's just like I learned not what to touch, what not to touch <laughs> when it was plugged in. So, so we, we do a lot of hardware hacking with haptics because we just don't necessarily have the technologies out there. We want to understand what this means because it's, it's, it's very likely that these things will be coming out. And, and again, things like this electrostatic capability is something that's really, really exciting. Um, I was in, in Finland uh, in August and we visited with a haptics research group at the University of Tampere. And they are doing some really cool work with different types of haptic displays, but from an automotive perspective. And so they're being funded by Volvo to take a look at how you can improve driver safety. And, and one, of the, one of the creepiest ones was a little uh, set of air puffers that are in the headrest that give you different types of directional and alerting signals by little puffs of air touching your neck. I thought that was, that was creepy. And then there was the various uh, seat vibration features. So, so, so yeah, the, the automotive stuff is very interesting. But what was also interesting was these touch screens which had directed puffs of air. So it was, it was really cool how he did it. So as your finger approaches the screen, you begin to feel where the buttons are before you even touch the screen. And then they have this electro-polymer uh, surfaces that as you uh, push against the screen, you feel the snap or the actual click of the button. You feel essentially this, this, the, the surface of the screen stretches and snaps back very quickly. So these are all really cool things that are in labs now. And I have a feeling that we're going to see a lot of fascinating tactile interfaces. And just think about the potential for accessibility and engagement and making these interfaces really uh, a lot more uh, real to the, to the user, to the student. Thank you. Okay, I think one more. Uh, you mentioned that you had uh, wished that there were students at ETS. Is that an opportunity, perhaps, for interns? at uh, the organization? Yes, indeed. And we are going to be announcing our intern uh, program fairly soon for next year. And so, yes, we do take interns. And so keep an eye out on the ETS.org website or drop me a line because I'll be looking for interns. I've, I've had, I've had uh, a couple of interns over the past, I've been at ETS for three years, and, and they've been great resources. They've been a lot of fun to work with, and they have just absolutely great ideas. In fact, the haptic stylus was was the idea of uh, one of my students who was also learning to use a white cane because he had never learned to use a white cane. He came from India. And so he had a, a transition to the white cane and said, what if I can use a white cane on a screen? And that led to this, this brainstorming on the, on the haptic stylus. So mm -hmm. a great, great opportunity for, for a student to come and join us great. for three months. Expenses paid. Nice. Wow. OK, lunch. Expenses to pay.